you have to recognize that there is an inherent privilege in, in marriage that uh, socially we all accept and you have to be willing to dismantle that within your own marriage in order to make space for the people that you're bringing into it. Welcome to Wild and Sublime, a sexy spin on infotainment, no matter your preferences, orientation, or relationship style. Based on the popular live Chicago show, I chat about sex and relationships with citizens from the world of sex positivity and comedy. You'll hear meaningful conversations, dialogues that go deeper, and information that can help you become more free in your sexual expression. I'm sex educator and intimacy coach, Karen Yates. Our monthly Patreon supporters pay for a large part of our operating expenses. Their contributions from $5 on up help us big time. Plus, members get discounts on show tickets and merch and receive Wild and Sublime news before anyone else and more. Interested in helping us spread the message of sex positivity? Go to patreon.com forward slash wild and sublime. Hi, folks. Welcome to Wild and Sublime in 2024. We took an episode off, and that felt great. It gave me time to clean my bathroom and make cookies. Not in that order, though. Bathroom cleaning always comes last. Now, I don't know about you, but I am really, really planning on 2024 being better than 2023. I don't usually say stuff like that, but wow, 2023 rocked me like a hurricane, and I don't mean that in a scorpion's kind of way. I mean, really, it was a ludicrous year with a lot of health stuff, but I'm thinking there can't be two years in a row like that, right? No. No, there will not be two years in a row like that. There were some cool things, though, like so many friends rallying around me when I was down for the count, which was amazing and incredible. And honestly, it made things so much easier to have so much love around me. People talk a lot about community, but when you are in trouble, it really is a thing that brings so much into your life. And That was the biggest takeaway for me about last year, about all the people that care for me and want to see me happy and wanted to help out. It was almost, I I will say it was a shock to realize how many people out there are, are there for me. And I hope you have the same in your life. Speaking of community, some folks see certain types of non-monogamy as a community endeavor. And that is one of the many things we will be discussing today as our panel chats about opening one's relationship. There were a lot of levels to this conversation for sure, which took place at our December 9th live show at Hungry Brain in Chicago. That show and this recording takes place on the tribal land of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Adawa, and the Potawatomi Nations. Now, have you been considering opening your relationship? Do you want more information in general? What is polyamory anyway and how to do it? What are the pitfalls? What about jealousy? Well, a bunch of these questions are answered as I engage with sex-positive somatic therapist Elmo Painter Eddington, tantric doula and empowerment coach Goddess Erica, and therapist specializing in all things kinky and queer Jacob Penrod. Goddess Erica will be the first to answer my question, followed by Elmo Painter Eddington. Enjoy. Ethical non-monogamy is what we are talking about tonight, a very large umbrella term. Um, And can you just, one of you basically, just talk about the differences between what makes it ethical versus ethical non-monogamy versus non-monogamy. <laughs> I've really been waiting to answer this question. Uh, I think that ethical non-monogamy is a unfair misnomer because it suggests that non-monogamy is not ethical. Um, if we are going to be applying descriptors to things, then we should also classify Um, ethical monogamy as a thing Okay. Um, because non-monogamy 
um, does not uh, imply that you are doing anything that is wrong, especially if there is communication and agreement involved. Awesome, awesome. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I have, I have a lot of things to say about the ethical piece, too. I've been saying consensual non-monogamy for mm. a bunch of years. I stopped saying eth ethical for a lot of similar reasons. And I also believe that when we, say, when we use the word ethical, there are also some kind of assumptions that can get thrown in there of um, systems of ethics that we're not necessarily subscribing to, like colonial ethics, religious ethics, um, even kind of compulsory monogamy ethics, um, patriarchy ethics. Um, there are some ways that these kind of sneaky systems of control can kind of come into um, just when we're using a system like that and saying like, this is ethical. Um, and people, have, I've heard people kind of get away with, get away with stuff or gaslight somebody in the name of, oh, I was doing ethical non-monogamy when they were not being consensual. Mm. Mm. Wow, great, great. Well, from here on out, this conversation, it will be consensual non-monogamy. <laughs> um, Jacob, what are, why do people start considering opening up their relationships? What are some compelling reasons that people think about? Yeah, so uh, my background is as a marriage and family therapist, so we see a lot of couples therapy. And the most common reason that I see is a sexual mismatch. So either someone is into something kinky or there is a, a difference in desire. And so one person just desires sex differently or more than someone else. That is the most common reason that I see, but it can be any number of things. Uh, I am a person who practices non-monogamy uh, in my life just because that's who I am and my relationship structures. And some people realize that that is who they are five, 10 years into a monogamous relationship. And so it's a, uh, inward desire that they're practicing outwards. Uh, there's any number of reasons that people could open up their relationship. Why would, um, what are some reasons, are there reasons that you see, uh, all of you, that maybe are a red flag about why someone would want to open up their relationship? It's definitely not a fix for mm. something that's wrong in a relationship. Um, if there is a mismatch, uh, it doesn't mean that opening your relationship is going to fix the thing that's broken within your relationship. So um, I think that when it's used as a way to, um, to placate another partner or to, um, to fix something that's not matched, it can become very problematic pretty quickly. And when you say placate, you mean like if the other partner wants to open the relationship and you're kind of going along with it, is that what you mean? Well, just like the, the conversation earlier with sex toys and, and picking something because you want someone to do something, you're expecting someone to do something, um, the same thing can happen with the way that you're arranging your, your relationship. If you want to push the relationship in a direction that you haven't agreed on that uh, wasn't expected at the beginning, it can be um, kind of harmful if you're doing it in a way that can uh, be a bit coercive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me of when people are like, we're having all these issues in our, in our relationship, so we're going to have a baby. Mm. And it's like, right, oh, right, no, right, right. no, that's not going to help. It's like, oh, we're going to, we have all these problems, so we're going to open our relationship. And all this, and it just makes things, it brings up different stuff, as I'm, we're probably going to talk about later. Opening your relationship just brings up different things to be triggered by um, attachment stuff that you didn't know were there before, and uh, it can, yeah, it's not, it's not a fix, for sure. I think it's a level of complexity, too. Mm. Uh, I like to talk about opening your relationship or beginning to practice non-monogamy um, as uh, if you are in a relationship and you are taking 101 classes. Opening up your relationship is advanced placement. You know, this is, you are, you have passed all of the stuff, you have proven that you understand how to run a healthy relationship, and now you are uh, exploring being able to push the boundaries of what that actually means and define that for yourself within your relationship, which is incredibly important. So what you're saying is a couple needs to be in a very stable, secure place to begin doing this work, mm -hmm. or opening up a relationship. 
if I ever see someone who's like, I guess I'll do this, that's a huge red flag. <laughs> like, no, it's, it takes a lot of work. You got to be committed to the relationship and the process. So just a, this is a last ditch effort or I'm doing this because my partner really wants it. Like that's, those are all red flags. Yeah, I mean, I do know people who are just like, I'm jumping into this um, without really understanding the complexities of what are involved. And so let me ask you, like, what, you know, communication is always talked about as like a main skill set that you need for being in any type of non-monogamous relationship. Um, I mean, I'm assuming you would agree. And, and what would you say about, like, about communication in general, like what, what do you need to build into a relationship or have in place to, uh, in terms of communication styles? What, what needs to happen around communication? Well, first things first, I think you need to be honest with yourself about what it is that you want, what it is that you need, what it is that is a deal breaker. Um, and when you communicate, you have to, um, begin with uh, in a space of, of vulnerability and also understanding that the other person may not be in the same place that you're in. And so if you're really committed to uh, maintaining the relationship, you know, really having a sense of patience and a sense of um, you know, being able to meet that person where they are because that's what a relationship is. It's you meeting a person where they are and them meeting you where you are and that's where you agree. Yeah, it's very vulnerable. I mean, especially beginning in the beginning, it's a very vulnerable process, and you're getting to know yourself in a new way. You're getting to know your partner in a new way. Um, you're having insecurities that you didn't know you had. Maybe, maybe your partner's having insecurities that neither of you knew that they had. And it's just yeah, being really patient, being really gentle with each other, um, and being able to hold that space and be supportive of where the other person is at and supporting their explorations too. Um, I know what I think we're gonna talk about, I'm skipping ahead, Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I would also say being able to uh, put aside your own defensiveness. There's gonna be things that are gonna come up around, I feel insecure or I feel jealous or this thing that you did hurt me. And to be able to hear your partner say that and receive it and not automatically try to explain, well, I had the best intentions, or I did this. That's not what they're saying. They're not always trying to blame you. So being able to put your defensiveness aside and have a really healthy, honest, vulnerable communication is really important. One thing uh, I wanted to talk about, because we can, we can go back and talk about other aspects once you get inside, what, being inside of open, an open relationship, but one thing that's, I think it's important to say is like we hear a lot about polyamory right now, and polyamory to me speaks of a very specific type of open relationship, which is one that has like built out emotional partnerships. Uh, multiple emotional partnerships, but there is like a whole spectrum of non-monogamy that I would love for you to, all of you to identify. Like there's a much larger space to play in around non-monogamy, and can, can you folks talk to that a little bit? Like what can exist? So I'm guessing you're talking about like swinging and don't ask, don't tell, and yeah, those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean it, it, it spans the, <laughs> the the best way to explain it is any way that you can uh, experience a relationship with someone there's there's going to be a, a space for that and so um, you know there are many different labels that you can apply to the way that you're practicing your relationship and also the way that people apply those relationships in their individual or the, to apply those labels in their individual relationships var varies from their individual understanding of what that is varies from their individual uh, agreements they have within in their relationship so um, you know we can talk about swinging we can talk about um, you know, polyamory, we can talk about having friends with benefits, we can talk about, you know, all of those different things, but we could be here all night. <laughs> right, right. But there's also, you know, types of relationships that are, are, don't even necessarily skew toward purely sexual. You mm -hmm. know, there's, there's relationships mm -hmm. between people who may be asexual and just enjoy companionship that can be a different type of relationship, correct? 
Yeah, and kink dynamics too, like mm -hmm. non-sexual kink dynamics. If you're in a DS relationship with someone or if you're just exploring the whole universe of, of kinky adventures and there's not necessarily a romantic or sexual component there, but there's still that still falls under the non-monogamy. It can still fall under the non-monogamy umbrella. And having like really deeply emotionally intimate relationships with people and just kind of having that be a little bit more normal, thinking of like um, queer platonic relationships and um, like romantic friendships and like spiritual intimacy with people where well, living kind of in the context of compulsory monogamy culture, um, there can, it can be a little bit more tricky to, to navigate those things without somebody feeling like something has been ruptured or there's possessiveness maybe um, or there are kind of some other kind of some of those sneaky eth ethical things coming in. Can you describe what a clear, queer platonic relationship could look like? Yes. So um, queer platonic relationships are essentially relationships that are with um, people that you choose as a, a life partner. That it's not necessarily romantic, but the the intimacy the intimacy and commitment is there, and um, there, then, then there can be like really deep emotional connection, really deep emotional intimacy, and it can be um, as important as romantic partners or more important than romantic partners. It's just kind of querying the hierarchy of relationships, like what's more important, this romantic relationship or this um, platonic friendship, um, just kind of making different choices and breaking down all those concepts. Sam and Frodo from Lord of the Rings, queer platonic relationship. <laughs> got it, got it. Did you know the Wild and Sublime twice monthly newsletter has news, views, and tips about sexuality delivered to your inbox? Plus, info on the latest pod episode and upcoming live show. How do you get this for yourself? Sign up at wildandsublime.com. So people always, uh, when I talk about polyamory with people, the first thing out of their mouth, when, if they have not wrapped their mind around polyamory, they say, oh, the jealousy, I could never do it. Um, as, if, as if like polyamorous people aren't jealous or people in non-monogamous relationships aren't jealous. Can you talk a little bit about the jealousy angle? <laughs> So I think that that jealousy, and you know, I, I think this is probably the the example that that gets thrown around the the most often, um, that you don't uh, see an issue with jealousy between uh, your children. Um, you don't have a favorite child, or you don't have a favorite parent, or a favorite friend, um, and when you start to, and I, I I'd actually like to kind of like peel things back a little bit and kind of talk about it from my own personal experience because um, something that I noticed after um, opening my relationship and uh, beginning to explore polyamory with my, my husband and adding on partners and uh, experiencing loving connection with, with other people, um, it wasn't necessarily the freedom of having additional sexual relationships that was the most intriguing to me. The thing that was most intriguing was um, beginning to understand the depth of the other non-sexual relationships that I had. And so I recognized that I have a life partnership with my best friend. I have a, um, a romantic relationship with a very close friend. I have a, um, a deep spiritual relationship with another friend. I have a you know, BDSM type relationship with people that is non-sexual and outside of those BDSM uh, spaces, it's a platonic friendship. And so being able to recognize that you can create whatever relationship that you want for yourself, that's the beauty of polyamory. It's not so much about like having a, a hall pass. It's, it's so much more complex than that. And when you apply it to the way that you see all of your relationships, then it begin, you begin to think about jealousy um, a little bit differently. Because yes, of course you're gonna be jealous, 
but you know you also find uh, ways to work through that jealousy to recognize it within yourself and then uh, you know bring it outside of, of you and 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 communicate that that jealousy or those feelings in ways that are healthy and uh, not harmful to your relationships mm. thank you thank you Jacob yeah jealousy isn't going to kill you any emotion isn't on its own going to kill you right and so when I hear people say oh I could never do it because I'd get too jealous it feels like it's just like catastrophic fear that jealousy is going to like destroy my life and when you're actually able to sit with it sure it's super uncomfortable I don't love feeling jealous but I can move through it I can sit with it I it can be okay and I can if there's things that I need from it like I need connection I need reassurance I can ask for those things but jealousy in and of itself is just an emotion. It just is part of our experience. And also, I kind of want to finger wag just a little bit. We have normalized toxicity and monogamous relationships. Mm. Jealousy to the point of, right, <laughs> jealousy to the point of being like, you know, oh, I just want to oh, turn over tables. And, you know, people will be like, I would kill my partner. Like, use those words. Like, exactly. that's, that's scary if you actually kind of step back and think about that for a second. That's not... That's not healthy. Right, right. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's really important, I think, also to think about the, the difference between having boundaries, between boundaries and control. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we think about the, the Jonah Hill stuff that just came out a couple months ago where he, the, his, his partner at the time like released this text that he sent with his boundaries uh, that said things like, you, I don't want you to wear certain things, I don't want you to hang out or spend time with this person or this person, or I don't want you to work at, as a model anymore. Some, you know, like, and like these are my boundaries. And it's like, oh, he needs to fire his therapist, like if he thinks that's what boundaries are. Right, right. So like, it's really, really important to um, to be able to sort through those things. Like, are we? Like, boundaries are for me, like my mm -hmm. personal safety, my personal health, and like, you know, if somebody is not going to be respecting my boundaries, that's my. It's up to me to choose if I want to stay in that relationship or not in that situation or not um, and or like maybe we need to just change the dynamics um, so for example in polyamory a, a boundary is you know if you're gonna like have sex with someone or if like unprotected sex happens do I need to know that and that's because that's for my health that's for my personal health um, and then you know for if that happens then okay we wait you get tested we figure it out um, and then if this person keeps doing that and it's, you know, then it's up to me to, to decide if I'm gonna stay with that person or not because of that risk to me. But a control would be, I can't trust you, so you have to be, uh, you, uh, you can't hang out with your ex anymore, or like uh, you can't do X, Y, Z anymore, you can't go to the club anymore. That's controlling behavior. So um, it's really important to differentiate between those two things. It's interesting listening to Goddess Erica and you, Elmo. Like one of the uh, one of the things that came into my mind is, we're, we still have to get out from under this idea of possession mm -hmm. that we possess, mm -hmm. even if you're in a monogamous relationship, that you possess your partner. I mean, a lot of times on social media, I'll, I'll see someone say, "Oh, this is me and my guy," or "This is me and my gal," and it's like, ugh, there's a part of me that's like. Ugh. <laughs> Oh, it's like, do you own them? Is, are they yours? You know, but um, but I mean, I think that that's that kind of insidious um, stuff we're talking about. Can we talk about how monogamy, uh, the way it's practiced right now, is low key a kink? Oh, absolutely. Sure, let's go there. Oh my let's God. Let's go there. <laughs> if if we were to um, have uh, non monogamy. The, the way that I kind of described it as like relationships are relationships, this is how they are. Um, if we were to have that as, as the, the level set, the normal, right? Um, I don't belong to my husband and he doesn't belong to me. Um, and so any rules about how I engage with other people are, are rules and rules are things that kinky people apply to each other and agree on. And so if my rule is I'm going to pretend that I'm not attracted to other people and I'm going to, you know, <laughs> you know, ignore all advances of, of, of other people, 
that's, in, in the world that I come from, that's something that I put on a, uh, you know, a protocol document <laughs> and, and, and someone has to agree on. And so I think that uh, what we've kind of socially kind of agreed upon is that, that compulsory monogamy, the way that it currently exists, is just a kink that everybody's kind of practicing because you, you, we yeah. don't belong to other people. We are all free individuals. You're laying down some wisdom. <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> So final question, how, uh, if, a, if a couple is interested in beginning to, you know, start, they're starting to move down the line and maybe they have had some conversations and say, okay, let's do this. Is there a period of experimentation that can exist for people? Like how do you, or most people just jump in and then splat, you know, they land out, they're like, they're, they, they think they're gonna fly out the window but then they drop to the ground. But like what, I'm not talking about anyone I know, but um, like what, What? like can there be an interim period? Like what, help me out. Like diet poly. <laughs> what, what did you say, diet poly? Yeah, like yeah. diet poly or yeah. like poly flavored LaCroix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was Zubin's joke, I cannot take credit for that. Zubin, that was Zubin's joke. But um, the, so I don't know if there's like, cause it, it's so, uh, everybody's gonna have different stuff come up. One person's, um, this is easy for me, is gonna be another person's, this is almost impossible for me. And like, you know, that's across the gamut. It's such a subjective experience. It's such a personal experience. You might be doing something that feels like a, you know, poly light or whatever and all of a sudden there's like a big uh, explosion in, in, in your nervous system or um, there's stuff coming up in your relationship that, so I don't know, I've, I've not heard of like, I mean, I don't know if, the, and I've been poly for 20 years, I don't know, I haven't heard of anything, okay. so if you all know anything. So I think a, a nice like try before you buy is just have conversations. You know, like talk about people that you're crushing on. And it doesn't even have to be like the coworker. It can be the celebrity. It can be someone that, you know, you, you're never going to have an interaction with. You know, or... Nicole Kidman did this to Tom Cruise and Eyes Wide Shut and all hell broke loose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, mileage may vary. <laughs> so. That does feel like a Tom Cruise problem specifically. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it could be as simple as, you know, sitting at brunch and, you know, talking about how you think the, the person at the table across from you is attractive. You don't have to take action, but I think that um, being able to, again, be honest with yourself and be honest with your partner and really start to, um, and this is, and we're talking about monogamous relationships when we're talking about opening up, because there's also people who decide this from an individual place. So, right, you know, right. it, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you start together. Um, but if it's something that you are starting from yourself, then it has to be a conversation that happens pretty early in, in any new relationships. Um, but I think conversation is probably the, the first way to go. You know, you gotta lowball it, just talk about it, talk about it. I also think it's good to check in Ever, like pretty regularly about the structure of your relationship, whatever it is. Hey, is this working? If you're together for five, 10, 15 years, you're gonna be a different person from when you started the relationship. Maybe the rules you established at first don't fit anymore, or maybe you have more flexibility, or maybe your needs change. So um, I, rec I might personally recommend at least once a year checking in to be like, how are you doing? How are things going? Do we need to make any adjustments? Um, but if you're trying out polyamory, non-monogamy, maybe check in a little bit more often, every three months, six months, whatever works for you. And I think that's actually a, a really great way to, to try it, is maybe put a time limit on it. Let's try this for three months. Let's try it for, for six months. And if it doesn't work, then it's not for us. You know, like you don't have to dive all in. You don't have to like strap on the bungee cord and you know, hope for the best. You can, little tiny bite sizes, you know? It doesn't have to be everything. You can, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really a good idea to go over your boundaries um, frequently because uh, people are growing and changing all the time and relationships are growing and changing, circumstances are growing and changing. So 
um, just kind of getting in there and giving your boundaries a little jiggle. Like, are these, do these still fit? Do these still feel right? Um, and yeah, n just kind of remembering that um, nothing needs to be totally in stone forever. Right, people change, people change. The panel then came back on stage later to answer written anonymous questions from the audience. Okay, question number one. Oh my gosh, it's a doozy. How do we deprogram all the messages we've received about monogamy once we've decided to embrace non-monogamy? Girl. <laughs> you don't? Okay. Not fully, at least. Okay. Say more. I mean, like with any uh, deconstruction of internalized whatever, it's always a process. It's always a journey that you're never done with. Um, but I think just being uh, in communication with others and yourself around like, oh, ac actually, that is me trying to control you. That's ownership. That's uh, like internalized monogamy or whatever. Um, being in conversation, being really honest with yourself around your wants and needs, all the like skills that we talked about, about navigating non-monogamy, work also internally for yourself as well. Yeah, I think also just not personally identifying with any specific label or idea um, and allowing yourself to be open to, um, to learning something new and to dismantling something that you thought to be true or right for so long because that can be a really um, world-shattering uh, process. And so giving yourself some grace and realizing that you're always gonna be learning about things that you didn't know you didn't know. Yeah, like I said before, I've been poly for over 20 years and I, even just this year, I've had like the fucking doors blown off of like things that I thought I knew about myself and things I thought I knew about relationships and stuff like that. I mean, you're, you're never gonna be um, done unlearning certain things. Okay. Um. I'm married and my girlfriend has trouble around feeling less important because she feels hidden, but also like she'll never catch up to the 19 years he and I have had together and because, oh, hold, hold a second. I'm gonna read this whole thing again. I'm married and my girlfriend has trouble around feeling less important because she feels hidden but also like she'll never catch up to the 19 years he and I have had together and uh, because of the privilege marriage, marriage holds. Thoughts? First question is, is she hidden? And, and if, if she is, then that's something that, that needs to be addressed initially because um, that, that's harmful. And you have to recognize that there is an inherent privilege in, in marriage that uh, socially we all accept and you have to be willing to dismantle that within your own marriage in order to make space for the people that you're bringing into it. Yeah, being poly is, I mean, there's a, there's a closet associated with that too. I mean, you come out as queer, you come out as all these other things and if you're not out to your family members and your friends and your community, yeah, your partners can feel like they're a secret, like they're hidden and it's like, it's like it feels like being in the closet. It doesn't feel good. And also just give yourself grace if you are in a, a, an established relationship, whether that be a marriage or otherwise, recognize that there is a learning process and that you're going to get things wrong. I personally can acknowledge that when my marriage was, was opening up, that there were many of many missteps that we made. We considered hierarchical for a while until we realized that that was harmful. Um, you know, I remember being afraid that the neighbors would know that you know there was some strange guy coming in and out of my house, and having to dismantle those personal um, judgments and those expectations about what um, we have been privileged to um, to kind of accept as part of. The, the normalcy of a relationship, we had to really break all of those things down. In my relationships, I, I've told my partners this as well, it's you know a different part of my heart than the other, uh, other partners that I have do. And it's not to say it's better or worse or more or less than those other partners, it's just different. And 
obviously healthy communication, is there something that's hidden? Of course, that is a huge part of it. But if it is just this like internalized feelings of insignificance saying, what is unique about this relationship? What is special about this relationship that mm -hmm. you don't get from anyone else? And really finding value and resting in that. Great. One of my favorite um, metaphors for comparison is like, do you compare a bamboo tree to a pine tree? Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. these relationships are so different. Mm -hmm. Like my relationship with this person is very different than my relationship with this person. And it's, there's no, this one's better than the other. They're just very different experiences. And I have, there are different aspects of myself that come alive in different relationships. And I think that's true for everybody, like our friendships, our fa families, our uh, partners, um, our kids. And I, I also think that just, I wanna t uh, acknowledge the, the time that the question um, brought up that, you know, this p new partner could never uh, catch up to the 16 years. I think that you have to think about it differently. Are you committing yourself to this person in a lifelong context, the way that you've committed yourself to your, your other partner? And if so, it could catch up, and you have to kind of allow yourself to treat them as if it already has, if that's what you're committing to. Great. Um, what's, the best, what's the best place to meet consensual, non-monogamous, poly people, apps and non-apps, in other words, in real life. Look around this room. <laughs> <laughs> Who's cute? <laughs> also, there's an app called Field, F-E-E-L-D, that a lot of folks use. Um, it's a, it's a non-monogamy dating app. There's also, uh, if you go on Meetup, which is, um, you know, a, um, site that where you can meet like-minded people, like if you like to cook or whatever, but it's also polyamorous. The polyamory community in Chicago has, uh, has a group and they do poly cocktails once a month. There's like poly, ver various poly meetups that people can go. Um, a lot of couples will go to the poly cocktails just to kind of check it out, check out the scene without kind of like, it's one of those experimental moves you can try. So that's, uh, that's another way. Grinder, Sniffies, the back room at Cell Block. Fat uh, <laughs> Life. Fet <laughs> Steamworks. Steamworks, yeah. <laughs> okay. How do you determine what needs must be met by any partner you have versus needs that only need to be met by an individual partner? I'll say that again. How do you determine what needs must be met by any partner you have versus needs that only need to be met by an individual partner? Ask, <laughs> just ask. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I love to have a, um, a list of questions that I ask before I start any relationship. And that's not just uh, a romantic relationship, it's uh, business relationships or relationships with uh, people that I'm planning to do something, you know, particularly involved. And the first question I, I ask is, or one of the first questions I ask is, um, how do we want to do this? How do we want to, what, what do we want this to be? And that's such a powerful question to ask, and one that we don't really ask in, in a, a lot of situations. And it could be useful, not just for romantic, but for any situation. How do we want to do this? Mm. And if you're trying to figure that out for yourself, uh, one, therapy, I'm gonna plug therapy, um, but being really honest with yourself and saying, is this something that I need from all my partners? I need a level of openness and vulnerability, but also like, I go on tangents, I have my own like special interests, I need all my partners to understand that about me and give me space for that, right? That's a universal thing. Whereas what I need from my boyfriend is different from what I need from my sir, for instance. Like those get to be separate things. And that's partly, I learned that about myself through therapy and partly trial and error okay, I think I need this from everyone. Actually, I really only need this from you. Mm -hmm. And turning that around too, and that what are you able to offer? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you have on offer? And I, mm -hmm. one of the most important skills for non-monogamy is self-awareness and kind of taking responsibility for knowing your own capacity, right? Or your own relational capacity. Love is not, an, love is an unlimited resource, right? Like we say that a lot in, in polyamory, but 
time, energy, attention, and capacity are very limited for a lot of us. Um, people have kids, jobs, friendships, chosen family, right? Um, and just kind of knowing about yourself, uh, what you have to give if you're somebody who really values your friendships, if you're an introvert and or neurodivergent and need a lot of alone time, that like, you know, you have to factor that in too before you're like, okay, this is what I have to offer and kind of managing expectations and that way when you're starting something new and knowing that um, discovering things about yourself, discovering these kinds of things about yourself takes trial and error. So, you know, being patient with yourself and being patient with your people, knowing that we're, we're all kind of still figuring this out in some ways and kind of just balancing that with, yeah, going to therapy and um, knowing what you've got. And also, can we frame that question from a positive? Like, it, it almost sounded like a, a someone feeling like the way that they uh, are doing things is broken. Um, I think that we have to, I, I like to, to think about the, the way that we exist in the world, like we're all kind of like disco balls. And we've got all of these little tiny facets that reflect the world in different ways. And so different people are reflecting back to us versions of ourselves mm -hmm. that are incredibly different. And if you look at that as, as an opportunity, if you look at that joyfully, you will see that it's not necessarily about like fixing how do you meet other people's needs, but recognizing where you fit in context with other people and enjoying and, and really um, not trying to shoehorn things, but being at peace with where things are. Great. Um, this is the final question. I'm solo polyamorous. I'm starting to transition out of it toward monogamy, but feel weird about it. Like what, like what to tell folks, both my poly friends and my mono friends? Thoughts, advice? That's interesting. And I, I think that um, I would probably ask the question um, the way that we would ask if someone was starting to um, open up about their polyamory to, after being outwardly monogamous is, uh, and in what context do we need to actually express that? If you're solo polyamorous, and, and can we define that really Yeah, I was, I was hoping <laughs> someone would define it. Yeah. yeah. So um, I actually, I, I Google searched it this morning because I, I understood what it was, but I wanted to double check that, like my understanding of it, because I think that when you, you think about it, there's lots of different ways that you can kind of understand it. And solo polyamory essentially means that you, um, you are a single person who is uh, dating multiple people, but you're engaging in a solo lifestyle, so you don't have any entanglements with your finances, you don't have a nesting partner, as we like to call it, you don't have any other like, um, like life connections to another person. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to kind of like issue as a warning about, and this isn't to say that solo polyamory is necessarily like a, um, a bad thing. I think that, again, we have to have like different ways of expressing ourselves in our relationships. Um, but polyamory, I think, is, is this wonderful way of bringing back community to um, what has uh, been a, a long time harmful, uh, like compulsory idea of these uh, individualized family uh, units. And we are learning that that is not something that um, is healthy for, for most people, that community is necessary, that not necessarily sharing resources, but being able to share time and connection and support is incredibly important. And so while solo, solo polyamory is, um, is valid and great, we also want to make sure that we are recognizing that um, that it it kind of can get down the same path as compulsory monogamy if we aren't careful. Um, and I know that wasn't to answer any of the question, <laughs> but I, I kind of wanted to just get on my soapbox a little bit about that. Jacob or Elmo? Uh, this also doesn't directly answer the question. <laughs> I would be really curious to hear this person, and in the most like genuinely curious way, 
why? And not like why to say you shouldn't or whatever, but how does this fit into your life story? What about your understanding of yourself has changed and grown and evolved? And I think with that story and understanding how this transition fits into your life story, that can then shed light on how do I go about telling people? Do I need to tell people? In what context do I need to tell people? Um, I'm a big fan of narrative therapy as well, so really investigating that life story. And also, like, ask yourself, uh, and, and I'm making a huge assumption here, so please, if this is incorrect, um, but ask yourself, are you no longer solo polyamorous, or are you just practicing a monogamous relationship with someone right now? Because that's incredibly valid, too. You can still be polyamorous and be in a monogamous relationship. Again, mm -hmm. like we just discussed earlier, like it's a choice. It's a choice to be monogamous. And when you recognize it as such, you can be in a monogamous relationship without entertaining the other options if that's what you choose. Great, Elmo. Yeah, I'm curious about the, the why. Um, so when, when we come out in any way, there's a, there's a vulnerability there and there's, uh, we come out to people that we trust essentially, like has this person earned the right to my story? Has this person earned the right to hear about what my intimate life is like? And if this person is afraid of coming out and being judged, then is that giving you some information about those friendships? Is that giving you information about um, kind of some of these groups that you're, that you're running in that you're afraid of being judged by them because of what you're feeling is true and right for you right now? an opportunity to assess your safety in the spaces that you exist in. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elmo, Goddess Erica, and Jacob. <laughs> well, that's it, folks. Have a marvelously pleasurable week. Wild and Sublime is supported in part by our Sublime supporter, Full Color Life Therapy. Therapy for all of you at fullcolorlifetherapy.com. Thank you for listening. Know someone who'd like this episode? Send it to them. You can follow us on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram at Wild and Sublime. And sign up for newsletters at wildandsublime.com. Got feedback or an inquiry? Contact us at info at wildandsublime.com. And we'd love a review or rating on your podcast player. I'd like to thank our design guru, Jean-Francois Gervais. Music by David Ben Porat. This episode was produced and edited by Christine Ferreira at the Lincoln Lodge Podcast Studio as part of the Lincoln Lodge Podcast Network. <laughs>